Who knows why Fabritius painted the goldfinch at all? A tiny standalone masterpiece, unique of all its kind. He was young, celebrated. He had important patrons, although unfortunately almost none of the work he did for them survives. You'd imagine him like the young Rembrandt, flooded with grandiose commissions, his studios resplendent with jewels and battle axes, goblets and furs, leopard skins and costume armor, all the power and sadness of earthly things. Why this subject? the lonely pet bird, which was in no way characteristic of his age or time, where animals featured mainly dead in sumptuous trophy pieces, limp hares and fish and fowl heaped high and bound for table. Why does it seem so significant to me that the wall is plain? No tapestry or hunting horns, no stage decoration and that he took such care to inscribe his name and the year with such prominence, the year he made the painting would also be the year of his death. There's a shiver of premonition about it somehow, as if perhaps he had intimation that this tiny mysterious piece would be one of the very few works to outlive him. The anomaly of it haunts me on every level. Why not something more typical? Why not a seascape, a landscape, a history painting, a commissioned portrait of some important person, a low-life scene of drinkers in a tavern, a bunch of tulips, for heaven's sake, rather than this lonely little captive chained to his perch? Who knows what Fabricius is trying to tell us by his choice of tiny subject, his presentation of tiny subject. And if what they say is true, if every great painting is really a self-portrait, what, if anything, is Fabricius saying about himself? A painter thought so surpassingly great by the greatest painters of his day, who died so young, so long ago, and about whom we know almost nothing. About himself as a painter, he's saying plenty. His lines speak on their own. Sinewy wings, scratched pin feather, the speed of his brush is visible, the sureness of his hand, paint dashed thick, and yet there are also half-transparent passages rendered so lovingly alongside the bold pastel strokes that there's tenderness in the contrast and even humour. The underlayer of paint is visible beneath the hairs of his brush, he wants us to feel the downy breast fluff, the softness and texture of it, the brittleness of the little claw curled about the brass perch. But what does the painting say about Fabetius himself? Nothing about religious or romantic or familial devotion. Nothing about civic awe or career ambition or respect for wealth and power. There's only a tiny heartbeat and solitude bright sunny wall, and a sense of no escape. Time that doesn't move, time that couldn't be called time, and trapped in the heart of light, the little prisoner, unflinching. I think of something I read about Sargent, how in portraiture, Sargent always looked for the animal in the sitter. A tendency that once I knew to look for it, I saw everywhere in his work, in the long foxy noses and pointed ears of Sargent's heiresses, in his rabbit-toothed intellectuals and leonine captains of industry, his plump, owl-faced children. And in this staunch little portrait, it's hard not to see the human in the finch, dignified, vulnerable, one prisoner looking at another. But who knows what Fabricius intended? There's not enough of his work left to even make a guess. The bird looks out at us. It's not idealized or humanized. It's very much a bird, watchful, resigned. There's no moral or story. There's no resolution. There's only a double abyss between painter and imprisoned bird 
between the record he left of the bird and our experience of it centuries later. And yes, scholars might care about the innovative brushwork and use of light and the historical influence and the unique significance in Dutch art, but not me. As my mother said all those years ago, my mother who loved the painting only from seeing it in a book she borrowed from the Comanche County Library as a child, the significance doesn't matter. The historical significance deadens it. Across those unbridgeable distances between bird and painter, painting and viewer, I hear only too well what's being said to me. A pst from an alleyway, as Hobie put it, across 400 years of time, and it's very personal and specific. It's there in the light-riched atmosphere, the brushstrokes he permits us to see up close for exactly what they are, hand-worked flashes of pigment, the very passage of the bristles visible, and then at a distance, the miracle, or the joke, as Horst called it, although really it's both the slide of transubstantiation where paint is paint and yet also feather and bone. It's the place where reality strikes the ideal, where a joke becomes serious and anything serious is a joke. The magic point where every idea and its opposite are equally true. And I'm hoping there's some larger truth about suffering here, or at least my understanding of it. Although I've come to realize that the only truths that matter to me are the ones I don't and can't understand. What's mysterious, ambiguous, inexplicable? What doesn't fit into a story? What doesn't have a story? Glint of brightness on a barely there chain. Patch of sunlight on a yellow wall. The loneliness that separates every living creature from every other living creature. Sorrow inseparable from joy. Because what if that particular goldfinch, and it is very particular, had never been captured or born into captivity, displayed in some household where the painter Fabricius was able to see it? It can never have understood why it was forced to live in such misery, bewildered by noise, as I imagine, distressed by smoke, barking dogs, cooking smells, teased by drunkards and children, tethered to fly on the shortest of chains. Yet even a child can see its dignity, thimble of bravery, all fluff and brittle bone. Not timid, not even hopeless, but steady and holding its place, refusing to pull back from the world. Thank you.